you know, I want to speak to you for a few minutes about the Orthodox Jewish Bible. You know, the the Orthodox Jewish Bible was begun, the translation actually began in 1971, and it wasn't finished until 2008. But you say, may say, okay, so Dr. Goebel spent 31 years of his life, but why is that important to me? In other words, why do we need another English Bible? Don't we have enough already? Well, look at Isaiah chapter 7, 14 in the Orthodox Jewish Bible. It says, therefore Hashem himself shall give you an oath, supernatural sign. Hine, Ha'alma, the young unmarried virgin shall conceive and bear Ben and call Shemo, his name, Emmanuel. God is with us. So, from Isaiah's writings, we learn that stubborn and unteachable people, like the proud religious leaders in Isaiah chapter 28, and old proud King Ahaz in chapter 7, they don't lower themselves to factor in signs, but a sign of, of tongues is going to be given to the unbelievers in Isaiah chapter 28, and to Ahaz and the house of Dovid, a sign will be given of the unmarried young virgin conceiving. And this, of course, is a potentially scandalous sign. I mean, when you think of teenage unwed mothers, but the sign will be given whether Ahaz wants it or not. And, of course, judging from their young woman translation rendering of Ha'alma, apparently many Ahaz Bible translators have not wanted this sign, and they purposely left it out, even though it's right there. And when we think of the virgin, the only other times in the entire Tanakh that we see the expression Ha'alma, the virgin, is that unmarried young virgin Rivka, Rebecca, in Genesis twenty-four forty-three, who is preparing in that passage to conceive them of the nation of Israel, and that young unmarried virgin Miriam, who is pointing us to the Savior of the Exodus, Shemot chapter 2, verse 8. And when we begin our discussion, we point out that there really are only three Ha'alma virgins in Scripture the mother of Mashiach, Isaiah 7:14 the mother of the nation of Israel, Genesis 24, 43, and Miriam, the virgin, uh, pointing us to Moshe Rabbeinu and, and, and the, the savior of the Exodus, uh, Exodus chapter 2, verse 8. But in this passage we're talking about, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, Mashiach is promised. And you might say, well, what is at stake in this word, Ha'alma? Why is it so important? Why, I mean, what exactly is at stake? And the answer is, of course, everything is at, is at stake. Because if, if, according to the Hebrew Scriptures, Mashiach was not born of the Alma Virgin, then he is not supernatural. He's not Ben HaElohim. He's not the Mashiach. He's... He's not able to deliver us from death's eternal judgment. He's not God with us. And everything hinges on the meaning of that one word. So, to say the least, it's worth probing the, the scriptures to study, to study this word. And uh, I want to talk just for a moment about two other words that are also technical terms in the harem, in the king's harem. A passage in Judges chapter 8 mentions the royal bearing of the Pilagesh, the concubine. Uh, also, Shir Hashirim, chapter 6, verse 8, Song of Songs. The passage there infers the royal bearing in the harem of the Pilagesh as concubine, 
the royal bearing of Malka uh, as legitimate royal wife, the queen, that is the word Malka, and the royal bearing of Alma, who in the harem has the royal bearing of Betula or virgin, not merely young woman, since a merely young woman would throw a question on hereditary rights to the throne in the sense that any young woman who was only that, only a woman, only young, and then introduced into the harem other than a virgin would destabilize the dynastic heirdom for the reason that in dynastic monarchy the child would normally be of the king's body begotten and there can be absolutely no question about that. So in this matter the three classes of women in the harem, Malka, Pelagesh, and Alma, are crucial technical terms having to do not only with the, the sexual matters vis-a-vis -vis the king, but political matters vis-a-vis -vis the succession government of the dynastic monarchy. And this matter of royal bearing of the Alma or virgin is decisive in translating Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14, Ha Alma as the virgin. Uh, particularly here since the context of base Dovid shows that a royal Alma, not just any Alma, is in view. And when you look at Song of Songs, chapter 6, verse 8, it says there are three score Melachot queens and four score uh, Piglag, uh, Pilagshim concubines and without number Alamot virgins. Alma is the singular form, Alamot is the plural form. And uh, this word Alma, it's in Shir HaSharim chapter 1 verse 3, chapters uh, 6 verse 8, uh, Isaiah 7 14, Baratius 24 43, Shemot chapter 2 verse 8, uh, Mishlei chapter 30 verse 19, and in every case the word means explicitly or implicitly virgin. And where young unmarried woman is not an adequate rendering, since the king was hardly interested in young unmarried women in his harem, but demanded virgin unmarried women. They had to be unmarried. They couldn't belong to anybody else. That would make the king an adulterer. And they had to be virgins. Because the, the king's progeny had to be of his body begotten for the succession government to be stable. And for the king to be obviously the father of this prince. So the older Jewish translations like Harkavis in fact translated the word Alma as virgin in Song of Songs chapter 6 verse 8 until it became politically incorrect to do so in later more liberal Jewish translations into English and the Orthodox Jewish Bible is not a liberal translation it is faithful to the, the to the words as they've been used in the context look at Joel chapter 1 verse 8 where Betula is used of a married woman Alma is always a young unmarried Betula in scripture now I want you to watch if you would kindly indulge us and give us the time watch these videos there's there are only 10 minutes long there's just a few of them and in these videos we explain to you why you need the Orthodox Jewish Bible you can download it free of charge as an ebook from our website and use the search function to look at these words and you can then take a Hebrew Bible and actually verify that I that I faithfully transliterated and translated the original Hebrew text of the Tanakh. Thank you very much and watch the next video please.